Well, what's going on, everybody? I'm Jeff St. Pierre, and this is episode 101 of the Adult Education Podcast. This week, I'm speaking about friendships with Dr. Marissa G. Franco. First of all, thanks so much for checking out my show. I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to listen to adult education. The show is all about learning new things or maybe learning more about something. I speak with experts across all fields to learn more about health, education, technology, mental health, and really just about anything. If you'd like to support adult education, the best way to do so is to leave a five-star rating on whatever platform you're listening on. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts and you want to share a little review, that would also be great. And if you like what you hear, please share it with your friends. I love how word of mouth can inspire new people to check out this show. I think if there's one thing that we all learned during the pandemic, especially at the very beginning during all the lockdowns, it's the importance of connection with other people. According to studies, feelings of isolation and loneliness are seeing dramatic increases, and that also started even before the pandemic. In today's conversation, I'm catching up with Dr. Marissa G. Franco. She's a professor at the University of Maryland and writes for Psychology Today as well. She's dedicated her career to researching connection and learning about the importance of having a strong social network. I'm a person that really enjoys alone time. Some don't believe me, but I would probably describe myself as an introvert. I joked with Dr. Franco that the pandemic was kind of my Super Bowl. I mean, lock me inside my house with my family and cancel all my social events. I've been waiting for that moment forever. Where do I sign up? I kind of felt as though I thrived in that new world of isolation. And while that situation may have worked out great for me, it was detrimental to so many others. Connection and friendships have been proven to be so vastly important to humans. Research has even proven that having strong social connections can extend your life by years. Marissa G. Franco discusses her research in a new book called Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. To say that we only scratch the surface during our conversation really is an understatement. There's just so much in this book that can be eye-opening to people, a lot of great information. Uh, it's funny actually here. So full disclosure, I record my conversations at home, usually during my daughter's nap time. On the day when I spoke with Marissa, I had actually fallen asleep when putting my daughter down for her nap. I just happened to wake up about three minutes before our scheduled interview time. I ran to my little home studio, started to set it up. So it took me a few minutes to get my groove with Marissa in the conversation because I was still a little out of it. <laughs> you know, that feeling when you first wake up and you're like, wait, what is going on? Uh, but I think we really got into some important stuff here. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Hello. Hey, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Well, uh, I am very excited to talk to you, uh, especially because you touch on something right at the beginning of your book, uh, Platonic, how the science of attachment can help you make and keep friends. That's kind of a trigger for me, and that's that people identify themselves by the relationships they're in. I've never been able to wrap my head around why that is something that so many people are. I guess I'm just not someone that has... Um, relied on their ability to have a romantic partner in their life. And and if I was, I'd be terrible at it. So I'd be failing all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly. I feel like my, the book is sort of a penance for my past of, of really feeling that way, that my own um, worth as a person and lovability was really dependent on whether I had a romantic partner and realizing that's such a limited way to view love. And platonic love has always been around me. And why doesn't that mean that I'm lovable? And just questioning, I think, our society and the real hierarchy that we place on love and the way that that really harms us. That idea of hierarchy that we place on love with romantic love in particular, it's kind of a this like checklist idea that people have that's always driven me crazy, this idea of like, okay, I'm going to get the degree, then I'm going to get the job, then I'm going to get the spouse, then I'm going to get the house, then I'm going to get... I was just talking about a, a friend of mine who's going through a divorce right now, and it turns out through the conversations that largely the marriage was because it was tied to the idea of like that checklist in their head. And it's like, well, they, the marriage never should have been there in the first place. They probably should have exactly. ended that relationship. But so much weight was put on that romantic relationship idea just because it was a romantic relationship, you know? Yeah, I think the script is so crushing that it transcends our own ability to discern what we really want for ourselves. Like it, when a script is that all encompassing, I think it just leads people to really lose themselves and to not wonder what are my needs? What do I actually want out of a relationship? What ways do I want to show up in relationships? How do I want to get my needs met? And to see that there's many different options to do that. And it doesn't always have to look the same way, this sort of, you know, traditional getting married and relying on a spouse. The idea of romantic relationships being weighed heavier than platonic love 
it hasn't always been that way. So, like, this might be a rhetorical question for you, but when did that switch happen? Because there was a time when platonic love was very important for people, and it was really how society moved on. So when did we see this switch where it turned into romantic relationships were the only thing that we could focus on? Yeah, so funny enough, you know, some historians have argued that romance the feelings that I idealize you, I am thrilled by you, I experience all these highs and lows from you, was arguably more of a part of friendship than it was a part of marriage. Because early 1800s and before, people got married for um, for resources. Like it's a good, it's strategic. Your name is going to contribute to my last name and it's a respectful thing. And, and it, in fact, around that time, the genders were considered to be so distinct, and this is, you know, obviously a very heterosexist history. The genders were considered to be so distinct that there was this idea that you can't possibly connect so deeply to someone who is not the same gender as you. And so friends were writing love letters to each other, carving their names into trees, sharing the same bed with each other, right? Things started to change in some ways when when, you know, around that time too, I should also clarify what homophobia looked like because it looked very different than it looks like right now. Specifically, it was stigmatized to have sex with someone of the same sex, but not to hold hands with them, but not to cuddle with them, but not to write love letters to them because none of this is sex, right? Mm -hmm. But then the psychiatrists, Richard Von Kraft Ebbing, Sigmund Freud, they sort of argued that if you have sex with someone of the same sex, that indicates an entire disordered identity. Mm -hmm. And then it was all of these things that were non-sexual began to be considered part of someone's sexual orientation. Now, if you hold hands, now if you, you know, cuddle, now if you write love letters to each other, we're going to start questioning your sexuality and shaming you for that. And that really destroyed friendships. And I think it destroyed men's friendships in particular. And then as women were getting more rights, they didn't need to get married to get a bank account, to own property, to get access to capital in the same way. And that devaluing of friendship helped give it help give women a reason to still get married, even though they might have had this alternative partnership, these friendships that they could also turn to for intimacy, right? So there's this devaluing of friendship that was thought to help stabilize this concept of marriage that got really destabilized as women didn't need marriage. And I would say that it's also very misguided because we know from the research that part of healthy romance is having a larger social support network. It's also interesting to me to think about because I've been one of those people in life, uh, a male that has always been more friendly with females. And that sometimes has gotten in the way of my relationships with women because a lot of women don't understand how a man can be friends with a woman and there's no sexual tension there or whatever. And, you know, listening to you describe where that was sort of that break in culture, it's interesting because now not only do we are we not able to have uh, friends with people of the same sex, we're also also not able to have friends of the opposite sex because there's that stigma of, well, well, you must want something from me sexually or romantically if you're friends with me and I'm the opposite sex of you. Yeah, it's like everything is has started to become sexualized mm. when we made our sexual acts an identity and not just an act. Um, and it's it's to our great detriment because... You know, the research basically shows that men who are friends with women experience more intimacy in their friendships than men who are just friends with men, for example, um, that men report a mix of either feeling closest to their woman friends or their men friends, whereas women tend to report that they feel closest to their woman friends, right? And so men really benefit from being friends with women, honestly, according to the research. But when we start to to always question these friendships and whether there's something else involved and see them as threatening when either of us enter a romantic partnership, we limit our ability to give, you know, people access to these deeper forms of connection. There was another statistic that I read in the book, and it's something that you don't hear very often. You hear all the time about how important sleep is to your health and how it can add years onto your life and how important exercise is to your health. But there's also a statistic of how important having a good social circle is. And that's not something that people really talk about. And the number, I'm trying to find it in my notes right now, I can't find it, but the number is so staggeringly large that to me it was like 40% or something like that. It was fascinating to think of how important those social circles are and how little emphasis we put on them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think those stats showed that um, exercise, healthy eating, it does contribute to our longevity, but social connection contributes a lot more mm. to how long we live and to our overall health and well-being. What we're up against, though, is a health problem that feels really invisible. Um, 
you know, there's just a certain visceral quality to eating healthy food and ingesting it in your body, which makes you feel like, oh, it makes sense that this is contributing to my health or exercise and feeling your body getting all sweaty. It's just very visceral. Whereas connection is sort of invisible, like it improves our mood, but we might not even know that it's happening. It happens gradually in each of our interactions. But I think we really saw in the pandemic, the invisible was made visible, the how it affects us when we're not around others, you know, people feeling so much more depressed and just a general malaise, I would say, because one thing that friends do is they expand our sense of who we are and they make us feel like an enriched version of ourselves. They make us feel like our identity is sort of blossomed. And so for me, it's definitely in that pandemic feeling kind of like a dysphoria or just a general sense of unease and a state of more isolation. So I want to ask you if, I know we don't know each other. We've only been speaking here for approximately 10 minutes. That's pretty much the only thing that you and I know about each other. But for me, I used to joke that uh, half joke when the pandemic started and everything went on lockdown that for me that was my Super Bowl like I have been practicing this for my entire <laughs> life I love not having to go do things I love my my home life I love being able to to do things as I want to do them where I'm at so for me removing myself from a lot of that social aspect of life I felt like benefited me but what I'm reading in your book is that it really didn't in a lot of ways so so I I guess I guess my question is how do I know if I'm really struggling if I don't feel like I'm really struggling does that make sense Yeah that's a great question and I think it really gets at the sort of research that finds that when people predict how much a social interaction will benefit them, they underpredict and they underestimate. And that limits their desire to actually engage in connection. And I always hear people say like, oh, I don't think I really need people, but it's something that you only understand how much you need when you are actually experiencing it. Cause our, again, our brain's sort of like under prediction mechanism. And so I think, you know, when it comes to friendship, I say, your prediction for how it turns out probably isn't as informative as your experience after it's already happened. So taking stock of how do I feel when I've spent all this time alone versus how do I feel after I've hung out with someone who I really do feel comfortable with and connected to versus how do I feel when I spent all this time alone? And I think about what it would be like to connect with someone. It's interesting, too, to think about how clear it became for so many people how much they needed social connection during the pandemic. And I can just use work for me as an example. I had a lot of coworkers who still to this day are very anti work from home. They hate the idea of work from home. And for me, I would think I can do my job a lot easier. I can get it done faster. I can get it done more efficiently. I'm more creative when I have the space and I'm not being pulled in a million different directions from the office. But as I would talk to my coworkers who hated the idea, it started to come out. It was like, well, I want to be in the office because my husband drives me crazy at home or because mm -hmm. I can't just sit there in isolation because I'll just go nuts, like being in my house. Like I need to be. So, it, you know, the idea of there was a lot of like this politicizing the idea of working from home and folks were turning it into like a left or right thing. But reality was just like, I just want to be around people. That's ultimately what it was coming yeah. down to. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny when I, I talk about with companies, um, you know, the, the need to belong and the importance of it at the workplace. One of the things I describe is this idea of the employee myth that when we go to work, our fundamental human needs are no longer there. And we can just clack away on the computer and work, work, work. And we don't need the same things when we become an employee. And that's just so false because, you know, we know from the research, for example, that having friends at work makes people more productive, makes people more engaged, makes them feel like their work is more meaningful, more fulfilling, makes them more likely to stay on the job. For example, lonely employees aren't as productive. They're more likely to miss work and and all of these things. And so connection is also really important wherever we are. And that's the workplace as well. Um, one of the things I talk about in the book though, is that workplaces aren't always a place for us to find connection, right? Because when we're kids, we have ingredients that sociologist Rebecca Adams consider essential for friendship to happen organically. And that's repeated unplanned interaction and shared vulnerability. Jim, recess, you know, lunch, we have those things. But when we get to the workplace, there's a study that actually finds that the more we hang out with people at work, the less close we feel to them. And the problem that I think happens at work is that we're not actually revealing who we are. And we're just sharing one part of ourselves, one is sort of employee side of us. We're only talking about work, right? And that doesn't actually make us feel connected to other people. And I think 
you know, if we want to connect it in the workplace, we have to stop talking about work and we have to be a little bit more human. Since we're talking about work, I want to ask you about a term that gets thrown around that some people have a little bit of a controversial thoughts on, but the idea of the uh, work wife or the work husband, I'm sure you've probably heard this phrase before, someone that you're just really close with of the opposite sex in the office that you just get along with and you kind of joke like, oh, that's my work wife. I would look at this as a good thing because you have that, you know, compadre, if you will, of someone in your office that you can go to with any problems. You feel the same things, you see the same things that are going on and you can really relate to each other. But there are other folks that may look at that and be like uh, uh, emotional cheating. Like you're, you're cheating on me because you have this emotional connection with somebody else. Where do you stand on something like this idea? I think we're all emotionally polyamorous, um, to be honest. I mean, according to the research, when we go to different people to help us deal with different emotions, it improves our well-being. When we include different types of people in our network, it improves our well-being. And when we become really insular, it not only we're more vulnerable to the ups and downs in our relationship. If we're only depending on a spouse, when that relationship inevitably goes through some difficulties, it impacts our mental health a lot more than if we had community outside of the relationship. And, you know, another study found that when people were experiencing fights with their spouse, they released cortisol, stress hormone in very unhealthy ways, but not if they had social connection outside of the marriage. So I think we can think about friendship and connection as a resource for our marriage too, as part of what healthy marriage looks like is to have connection outside of the marriage Rather than if you have this, you know, emotional connection outside of the marriage, then that's a form of cheating. There is a word you used a couple of seconds ago, uh, the word myth. And I think that there is a myth right now about connection because we are virtually connected to each other 24 hours a day now in today's society. Just by having a cell phone in your pocket, you're essentially connected to everybody in your network at the click of a button. But it's not real connection. And this has been something that's been studied and debated a lot as social media and things like like that uh, have been gaining steam. But in your book, you say connection fundamentally fundamentally shapes who we are. Are we in a place, though, where we are so siphoned off into echo chambers because we can separate ourselves into finding those groups, uh, the niche groups mm-hmm. that are exactly what we like all the time? Like, does that become more of a problem? You know, you have your specific uh, politics news channels that, like, if I'm a liberal, I go to this channel, and that's all I'm going to see is liberal-based news or conservative yeah. either way. Like, do we, do we think social media is becoming a problem in driving us into these sort of uh, echo chambers, if you will? In some ways, I think it can definitely contribute to how we um, tend to dehumanize people that really think differently than ourselves. I think too, like social media, I think in general has been a net negative for connection. You know, there's ways that you can use it to connect with people. There's nuance to this conversation, but I would say overall from the research that I've read, a net negative Loneliness has been increasing for a long time and continues to increase. And uh, the younger generation is lonelier than any generation before it. And about at about 2012, loneliness just started to skyrocket. And that's when smartphones became widely available. And what loneliness does is it increases our degree of something called social cynicism, which is a mistrust of social institutions, a disregard of ethical means for achieving an end. I speak of loneliness, not just as a feeling, but a state of mind. When you are lonely, you are in a state of threat. You think people are going to reject you, even when they're not. Um, You actually report liking other people less, having less compassion for people, for humanity, liking your roommate less. When people hurt you, you're more likely to respond aggressively than if you were not lonely. And this makes sense evolutionarily, because if you were lonely, you were separated from your tribe and you were in very much in danger. But the problem is that those those like fundamental signals are still happening when we're no longer in danger and they're amplifying our feelings of loneliness and they also have implications for how we engage politically. It's so interesting the way you put that about how loneliness can change the way you react to different situations. And you see that in so many of the horrible tragedies that we have in this world that the person, you know, say the quote unquote, the lone gunman. You look back at the history, they're a very lonely person. They're someone that doesn't have a lot of friends or doesn't have a family connection, doesn't have that social circle. And it's that is like the one common denominator that you see in just about every, you know, horrible tragedy like that. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's definitely a a predictor of violent behavior as well. Do you ever listen to a podcast, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, Revisionist History? Have you ever heard that? I've heard of it. I listened to like the first season, I think. 
The other reason I ask is there was a podcast or an episode recently, and it was about the show Will and Grace, the TV show Will and Grace. And they were talking about how groundbreaking it was because it had uh, a gay character as like the main forefront character in there that had never really been done before in TV. And they were talking about how there was a time in our life where, you know, before we had all these streaming services where everybody was sitting around a TV, there was the show that you watched every night where when you went to work tomorrow or you were sitting on the bus going into work, whatever, you could say, can you believe that they did this on Cheers or whatever show it was? Can you, and they would know exactly what you were talking about because that person also watched it with you. It was a shared experience that all of America was watching. So they, uh, long story short, with Will and Grace, when that show came on TV, I think it was like the early to mid 90s, uh, maybe the mid 90s, they, there was about a 25% support for gay marriage in America. By the time the show ended, it was over 50%. And what they were saying is when you look at the research, because so many people ended up creating an emotional connection to that show and to those characters, even if they didn't believe in it at first, they learned more about that. And it was something that kind of shifted culture. And I wonder, thinking about connection and the way that we've been discussing it, um, are we missing out on that by the fact that there's so many options that take us away from these shared experiences that now we have so many things that we can just dive right into exactly what we like? You know, we can check yeah. the box like, I love this. That's where I'm going now. I don't have to worry about anything else around me. Yeah, we're not necessarily challenged in the same way when everything is what we opt into. And I, I do agree with you that social connection is a mechanism for social change. And, you know, according to the research, when people become friends with someone from an out group, a group they're not a part of, it actually changes their opinion on policies for that entire group. They're more likely to support policies for that entire group. And in fact, when someone's friend's friend becomes friends with someone from a different group, that same phenomenon happens where now people are more likely to support policies benefiting that group. So it creates really ripple effects when we become friends with someone because friendship really just it's, it humanizes people. Prejudice thrives in dehumanization, in abstract, in, in thinking of people as abstractions. But there's no way when you're so up close to someone to think of them so abstractly. You see them in all of their complexities. You see them for who they are beyond this group membership that you maybe weren't as open to to begin with. And so I think social connection can be yes, is the medium by which social change will happen. And loneliness and disconnection is really a threat to that, to social progress. So having finding connection and having this platonic love with people, having these social circles is important, but it's also really important to make sure you have people in there that do not necessarily agree with everything that you agree with, because then you're able to see the other side of things. You're able to see the things from the other side of the tracks, if you will. It's tricky, I think, because if someone has such different values than you, I think a values alignment is something that people look sure. for in a friendship. And um, if someone has such different values than you that you can't really feel safe in a relationship with them, then I think a negative relationship can be worse than no relationship for creating connection, right? So when I talk about this, I think it's really important for us to understand our own capacities, yeah. right? Can we engage in these relationships in a way that feels healthy and good for us? And if we're like, this value is so strong for me and I get so triggered around it that I don't think I can build a healthy relationship with someone who has a difference in those values, I don't think we should force um, connection because if we do, I think the connection will end up being even worse. So I think we just need to be very discerning of ourselves and what our capacities are as we engage in these relationships. What I thought was really interesting, too, is in the way that we view ourselves also comes out in the way that we react with people in our social circles. Like you were talking, I think it was at the very beginning of your book, uh, about a few different people that you met while you were studying to get your degree. And there was one person that wanted to be the fixer in every relationship. So they kind of like strained their relationships because of that. There was one person that was super insecure in their relationships, and that had a problem in their social circles. And it was so interesting to see the way that we view ourselves coming out differently in those social circles. Yes. Our relationships are fundamentally a reflection of our sense of self. Um, there's actually this theory called self-verification theory, which argues that we look for relationships with people that verify our sense of self. So you see people with low self-esteem choosing, preferring to interact with someone that views them more negatively rather than someone who views them positively, not because they don't want to experience affirmation and love, but because 
they don't trust it when it happens because it it counteracts with their sense of self. It even causes an identity crisis. It feels like pressure, like, oh, you see me this way and I know that I'm really not this way. And so they continue to engage in these relationships that are unhealthy because of that, because of that poor sense of self. And, you know, I think that's a larger theme of the book. It's the idea that our insecurities create the conditions that further our insecurities it's it's so interesting because I think we both know people in our lives that have been in romantic relationships where you're like, really, this is the person you're going to go with? And I, I guess I had never really thought about it from the other perspective of like what they're seeing in that person is a reflection of what they're seeing in themselves. And it kind of breaks my exactly. heart that I didn't see that because now I feel bad that I didn't notice that <laughs> about my friend. Like I didn't realize how much they may have been struggling with a particular thing. Yeah. You know, there is a study on people in romantic relationships that I cite in Platonic that how they thought their partner saw them more strongly related to how they saw themselves than how their partner actually saw them. So how we think other people respond to us reflects how we see ourselves more so than it, than um, how much they, how they actually see us, how they truthfully see us. There is a person that I dated many moons ago. And I remember saying to her a couple of different times, you know, like you're a very kind, you're a very generous person. And it always got so much pushback, like for whatever reason, at that point in our lives, those terms were not positive terms to this person. And, you know, fast forward a decade or two, and that person has had, you know, multiple jobs within the, uh, the community circuit, like working for charities and raising money for different, you know, causes. And I'm like, see, this is you, like you are a kind and generous person. You're giving a lot of your time to help other people out. But at that time, she probably didn't see that she was in this phase where it was like, wait, I don't want to be kind. I want to be hard. I want to be tough. I don't want to be, you know, but it, in a sense, that was actually true about her life as she was ended up becoming such a generous person. It's so interesting to see how those things come out. It is. And it just shows how difficult it can be to change our sense of self when we are only taking in information that matches it and disregarding any information that is counter to it. So it's so easy to maintain low self-esteem when you notice especially those times when people treat you like you're unworthy. And every time someone treats you like you're worthy, you don't receive it. You assume that it's incorrect. You assume that they're trying to get something out of you. You assume that they're manipulating you, right? And so I think part of the ways that we grow in our relationships is really just being able to receive love and to take in love and to allow it to register within us. What, you obviously study relationships. You study connections. One of the things I'm so terrified for my parents, and I, I'm sure a lot of people are going through this with their parents, or if someone listening is, uh, you know, an, an older person in retirement age. Uh, my parents are both retired now, and they spent so much of their life working like crazy to support their three children and, you know, not making a ton of money. So having to work a lot and they don't really have friends. They don't really have that social circle. So now my, my mom in particular is interesting because she's like, I don't know what to do with myself. I don't have, I don't have those people. And you always hear people say about how it's hard to make friends as you get older, which, you know, in a sense, that's certainly true, but you got to put some effort into it. But I, I I, I wish I had advice for them. Like, I wish I knew what to say (laughs) to them now. Like I know they're in their seventies, but it's like, I wish you could have somebody just to have that outlet. Like you need like the girl, girls night or whatever to get out of the house and go do that. Yeah. I think even the advice that it takes effort is just so important because people are really just waiting for it to happen. Mm. Right. And if you think friendship happens based on luck, according to the research, you're lonelier over time. Whereas if you see it as being based on effort, you're less lonely because you try and you join that place of worship or that social group that you might've really liked. And that's really important. You say effort. That's interesting because I can think about some of my best friends and they are the people that are the hardest to get together with. Like it seems to take the most effort to get together with them. But when we do, when we do finally organize a gathering of a few different people, it is so much fun and it is so great to be around that, that that effort is such a key word. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a beautiful way that you put it. Like friendship is effort, but certain people make us feel like it's worth the effort and you know, those are our friends. For sure. Well, Dr. Marissa Franco, Marissa G. Franco, Platonic is the name of the book, Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. I wish I had more time with you because there is so much in this book that's so fascinating. And as someone who is kind of a self-proclaimed introvert and loner, it's interesting to learn about where I'm failing and why I need to do more <laughs> to get out of the house and go <laughs> and go make more social connections because clearly I'm missing out on something. These It just sounds so great. This research is fascinating. Where can people go if they want to find out more about you? or the book? 
Yeah. So I have a free quiz on my website that assesses your strengths and weaknesses as a friend, or you can hire me there for speaking engagements on connection and belonging within and outside the workplace. And that's drmarissagfranco.com, D-R-M-A-R-I-S-A-G-F-R-A-N-C-O. And that's also my Instagram handle at Dr. Marissa G. Franco, where I share more tips on the science of connection. Well, Dr. Franco, I love this work. The book is fascinating. Thank you so much for putting this out there. And it's been such a pleasure talking with you. I appreciate it. It was really great to talk to you, Jeff. Have a great day. Big thank you to Dr. Marissa G. Franco for her time today. Her book, Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends, is available now wherever you get your books. And thank you to all of you for your time today. I so appreciate you sharing some of your day with me. Until next time, be well.